This video provides a brief overview of the hepatobiliary system. What's the hepatobiliary system? Well, we're going to talk about the liver. The liver is an important organ with many functions. These functions include transportation, where it is responsible for the uptake, storage, and distribution of nutrients and vitamins. It also produces bile, cholesterol, and other products that are then used to transport goods and waste. The liver is a bit of a protein factory where it synthesizes most of our plasma proteins, including albumin, which is required for that uh, colloidal osmotic pressure, and our clotting factors that we need to clot our blood. The liver also helps cleanse our blood. It detoxifies and processes chemical waste, and this includes alcohol and many types of medications. The liver also stores energy and helps to maintain our blood glucose levels. Stored energy is in the uh, form of glycogen and the liver can make new glucose via gluconeogenesis. And finally, the liver has a waste management function where it helps recycle and dispose of waste from proteins and our blood cells. The liver is the largest visceral organ in the body. It weighs around 3.3 pounds. Note that the liver receives blood from the hepatic artery, so it receives arterial blood, and through the portal vein, and so venous blood will also go through it. Let's look at the different functions of the liver. One of the functions of the liver is to filter. And you can see this here through the hepatic blood flow diagram. The hepatic portal vein drains the organs of our digestive system, including our stomach, pancreas, spleen, intestines, and not pictured, also the esophagus. This allows blood from our digestive system to drain into the liver, allowing it to filter out substances and process them as needed. We will discuss how it processes uh, in the next slides. But it's important to remember that the flow of blood goes from these digestive organs through the portal vein into the liver so it can have this important filtering and processing function. The liver plays an essential role in carbohydrate metabolism and in glucose homeostasis. The liver cells have the ability to store large amounts of glucose as glycogen through a process of glycogenesis. When blood glucose levels are low, glycogen is converted back to glucose through glycogenolysis, which involves an enzyme phosphatase that is specific to the cells of the liver. The liver also synthesizes glucose from amino acids, glycerol, and lactic acid through a process known as gluconeogenesis so that we can maintain blood glucose during periods of increased need or fasting. The liver also converts excess carbohydrates to triglycerides for storage in our adipose tissue. While most cells of the body metabolize fat, certain aspects of lipid metabolism occur mainly in the liver. This includes the oxidation of free fatty acids to keto acids that supply energy for other body functions, the synthesis of cholesterol, phospholipids, and lipoproteins, and the formation of triglycerides from carbohydrates and proteins. During fatty acid oxidation, acetyl-coenzyme is made as a byproduct. The liver is unable to use all of this acetyl-coenzyme A so it converts the excess into acetoacetic acid, a highly soluble keto acid that is released into the bloodstream and transported to other tissues where it is used for energy. During periods of starvation, these keto acids are a major source of energy because fatty acids released from the adipose tissue are able to be converted into ketones by the liver. However, it is important to note the elevated levels of ketoacidosis can lead to a dangerous situation called ketoacidosis. The liver is an important site for protein synthesis and degradation. It releases secretory proteins into the circulation, 
and produces proteins for its own cellular needs too. The most important of these secretory proteins is albumin. Albumin contributes significantly to that plasma colloidal osmotic pressure and to the binding and transport of numerous substances, including some hormones, fatty acids, bilirubin, and other anions. The liver also produces other important proteins, such as fibrinogen and the clotting factors in the blood. Through a variety of anabolic and catabolic processes, the liver is the major site of amino acid interconversion. What does this mean? Well, we're talking about the metabolism of protein. Hepatic catabolism, or the breakdown and degradation, involve two major reactions, transamination and deamination. So let's look at what these two are. In transamination, an amino group is transferred to an acceptor substance. As a result, amino acids can participate in the intermediary metabolism of carbohydrates and lipids. So during periods of fasting or starvation, amino acids are used for producing glucose through gluconeogenesis. Most of the non-essential amino acids are synthesized in the liver by transamination. This process of transamination is catalyzed by aminotransferases, which are enzymes found in high amounts in the liver. Oxidative deamination involves the removal of amino groups from amino acids and the conversion of amino acids to keto acids and ammonia by transamination, allowing the transfer of an amine group from one molecule to another. Note that ammonia is very toxic to our body tissues, particularly our neurons. And so ammonia that's released during deamination is rapidly moved from the, removed from the blood by the liver and converted to urea. Essentially, all urea formed in the blood is synthesized by the urea cycle in the liver and then excreted by the kidneys. We'll also talk about alcohol metabolism. So alcohol is readily absorbed from the GI tract. It's actually one of the few substances that can be absorbed from the stomach. When you think about alcohol, it fits somewhere between a food and a drug. It supplies calories, but can't be broken down or stored as protein, fat, or carbohydrate. As a food, did you know the metabolism of alcohol yields 7.1 kilocalories per gram? About 80 to 90% of the alcohol a person drinks is metabolized by the liver. The rest is excreted through the lungs, kidneys, and skin. Alcohol, which we usually call ethyl alcohol or ethanol, abbreviated ETOH, uh, the metabolism of al alcohol uh, goes through two pathways. There's the alcohol dehydrogenase or ADH system which is located in the cytoplasm of the liver cells or the hepatocytes. And then there's also the microsomal ethanol oxidizing pathway or the MEOS pathway that's lo located in the endoplasmic reticulum. The ADH and MEOS pathways produce specific metabolic and toxic disturbances. The major pathway for ethanol metabolism involves ADH. This is an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of alcohol to acetaldehyde. In the ADH-mediated oxidation of alcohol, both acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde sorry, and hydrogen are produced. And so um, with ethanol metabolism, there's an excess of NADH, and this is what's thought to contribute to that liver damage that often accompanies excess alcohol consumption. In fact, it's this acetaldehyde that is produced that is eventually um, toxic to the liver and alcoholic liver disease. It's also important to understand that alcohol metabolism uses particular enzymes in the liver, specifically the CYP enzymes, that uh, metabolize many drugs such as Tylenol. So when individual um, drink alcohol 
and take some sort of drugs that also use that same metabolic pathway, it can increase the risk of hepatotoxic or effects or damage to the liver when you use both of them at the same time. So this, for example, is why they say you should never take Tylenol while drinking alcohol. Now we'll look a little bit about bile formation. The liver produces um, 600 milliliters up to 1200 milliliters of bile per day. We need bile to digest and absorb dietary fats and our fat soluble vitamins. Bile contains water, bile salts, bilirubin, cholesterol, and some of our byproducts of metabolism. Of these components, only bile salts, which are formed from cholesterol, or are important in digestion. The other components of bile depend on the secretion of sodium, chloride, bicarbonate, and potassium by the bile ducts. Bile salts serve an important function in our digestion as they aid in emulsifying or breaking up dietary fats, and they're necessary for the formation of the micelles that transport fatty acids and fat-soluble vitamins to the surface of the intestinal mucosa for absorption. Remember those micelles are like tiny little shuttles that help move these vitamins. And our fat soluble, soluble vitamins are K, A, D, E. Any bile salts that are in excess of 90% that enter the intestine are reabsorbed into the portal circulation through an active transport process. And from portal circulation, these bile salts can move into the liver cells and be recycled, so the body's very efficient. Now, bilirubin is the final product of the breakdown of heme that's contained in our aging red blood cells. And we break down our red blood cells every 90 to 120 days. We have a pretty good recycling system in the body, so we try to use all of the components. Now, bilirubin is that substance that gives the bile its dark color. And in the process of degradation, the hemoglobin from the red blood cell is broken down to form biliverdin, which then is converted into free bilirubin. Note that free bilirubin is insoluble in plasma, so it's transported in the blood attached to plasma albumin. Even when it's bound to albumin, this bilirubin is still called free because we want to distinguish it from conjugated bilirubin. As free bilirubin passes through the liver, it's absorbed through the hepatocyte cell membrane, and it's then converted into conjugated bilirubin, which makes it soluble in bile. Conjugated bilirubin is secreted as a constituent of the bile, and so then it passes through the bile ducts into the small intestine. In the intestine, about half of the bilirubin is converted into something called urobilirubin by our intestinal flora. So this is an example of how our microbiome is important in our normal bodily function. Now, sometimes individuals have abnormally high levels of bilirubin. And because of the color of bilirubin, it gives these individuals a yellowish skin coloring, often not quite the color of a Simpson. Uh, lower levels of jaundice, you might see yellowing of the eyes the sclera of the eyes or the mucous membrane, although individuals with extreme jaundice will, may have a yellow tinge uh, to their skin. This excess in bilirubin can occur due to excessive destruction of the red blood cells, impaired uptake by the liver, decreased conjugation of the bilirubin, or obstruction of the bile flow. And remember that once the liver makes the bile, it stores it in the gallbladder. And then finally, let's talk about some tests of liver function. We have liver enzymes that are important, and this includes alanine aminotransferase, or ALT, and aspartate aminotransferase, AST. Elevated blood levels of these 
liver enzymes usually indicate that there's liver injury. And these liver enzymes are generally the earliest indicator of liver disease. Uh, alanine, alanine aminotransferase is found mostly in the liver with less quantities in the kidney, heart, and skeletal muscle. So it's a much more specific indicator of liver inflammation or liver damage than AST because you may actually see aspartate aminotransferase in um, diseases of other organs such as the heart or muscle. Another test used in looking at liver function is serum bilirubin. If there is liver dysfunction, you will see an increase in serum bilirubin and you might even see some jaundice. However, as we noted just a minute ago, there are other causes of jaundice than liver damage. And so that in itself is not diagnostic of liver disease. And then finally, we will also look at gamma glutamyl transferase. This is a type of alkaline phosphatase um, and a measure of the excretory function of the liver. GGT uh, can be suggestive of hepatobiliary disease when they're increased, but again, they're not diagnostic. So your best bet is to look at your liver enzymes, particularly ALT. And that is our overview of the hepatobiliary system.